Hello and welcome to the second episode of Simply Intoxicating on Indirect Taxes. Although the Finance Bill 2016 proposes as many as 238 amendments, but the one which stands tall is relating to the Rule 6 of the Senate Credit Rules 2004. Since credit is the SSE's money, it is fair on part of the SSE's not to leave any penny of it if the revenue denies it by putting artificial curbs. Anyway, the CBC has genuinely made serious attempt to clean up the cobweb built over the years in Rule 6. Let us go to Hyderabad, where Mr. Vijay Kumar has five noted experts with him. But before that, let me invite my editorial colleague, Mr. Raghavan Rao, to explain the amendments in Rule 6. Before discussing about the amended Rule 63A, let us have a look at the existing procedure. If an SSC is engaged in the manufacture of utable goods and exempted goods, as per the existing provisions, no credit is allowed on inputs or input services used exclusively in the manufacture of exempted goods or services. With regard to the other credit, as far as inputs are concerned, the SSE has to pay back every month the credit attributable to the inputs used in the manufacture of exempted goods or services. And with regard to input services, the SSE has to quantify the credit based on the formula given under Rule 63A in proportion to the turnover of exempted goods to the total turnover. That means if exempted goods turnover is 20 percent of the total turnover, the SSE has to pay back a credit of 20 percent of the total input service credit taken. Now here there is an anomaly. Because in this formula, P denotes total credit taken on all input services. That means certain input services which are exclusively used in the manufacture of utable goods are providing taxable services are also apportioned in the ratio of exempted goods turnover. So this issue was highlighted in the case of Tyson Group before the Honorable Tribunal, wherein the SSE was asked to reverse a credit of 8.62 crores against total credit taken on common input services of rupees 2.07 crores. This is because the reversal has to be made even on the services which are exclusively used in the manufacture of dutiable goods where 100 percent credit has to be allowed. So this is one anomaly which is now rectified. The other anomaly is 6 percent demand. In some cases, the 6 percent demand on the value of exempted goods or exempted services ran into few crores when the credit taken on total inputs or input services is only few lakhs or few thousands. So the present rule 63A aims to rectify these two errors. Now let us look at the new provisions. As per the new rule, terms A, B, C and D are used and we need to know what is A, B and C and D. Here A is credit of duty on inputs or input services used exclusively in the manufacture of exempted goods. B is credit on inputs or input services used exclusively in the manufacture of dutable goods. C denotes credit on common inputs or input services. Now the SSE has to arrive at D based on the quantum of credit at C. Now let us assume the credit on input services or inputs which, which are used exclusively in the manufacture, manufacture of exempted goods that is A as 30 rupees and B credit on inputs or input services used exclusively in the manufacture of dutable goods say 80 rupees and C common input credit is rupees 40 rupees. Now the total credit allowed to an SSC is A plus B plus C that is 30 plus 80 plus 40 that is 150 rupees is allowed as credit. Now how to calculate D? 
for calculating d ssc has to arrive at the exempted turnover and the total turnover if the exempted turnover is 20% of the total turnover he has to pay back 20% of c that is d so finally at the end of the month ssc has to reverse a plus d that is 30 rupees plus 20% of c that is 8 rupees so 30 plus 8 is 38 rupees this reversal has to be made provisionally based on the earlier years uh, turnovers and once the total turnover is available for a financial year the final reversal has to be made and the difference has to be adjusted apart from the above the SSE also has an option of paying 6% or 7% as the case may be, 6% in case of manufacturer and 7% in case of service provider. So, this 6% amount has to be computed on the value of the exempted goods or services. And here in the new rule, there is a ceiling, this 6% amount is subject to a maximum of total credit available in the accounts of the SSE at the end of the period to which the payment relates. That is, he has to compute 6 percent or the total credit available in the accounts of the SSE at the end of the period. Actually, the JSTRU letter says the 6 percent amount is subject to a maximum of total credit taken during the period, but the same is not reflected in the rule properly and the rule says it is the total credit available at the end of the period. Another important amendment has been made to sub rule 4 of rule 6 which deals with credit of service uh, central excess duty paid on capital goods which are exclusively used in the manufacture of exempted goods or exempted services. Now before the amendment the rule reads no credit is allowed on any capital goods which are used exclusively in the manufacture of exempted goods or exempted services. Now, what will happen if at the time of receipt of capital goods, the finished product is dutiable, but say after one month or two months, if duty is imposed, can the SSE take credit? Now, it is a settled position that the eligibility of capital goods has to be examined at the time of taking credit. So, because at the time of taking credit, the SSE is engaged in manufacture of only exempted goods, no credit is allowed even when the goods become dutiable the very next day. So, though the capital goods are used for a considerable period for a manufacture of dutiable goods, in such cases no credit is allowed. So, to address this issue, a two year grace period is allowed under the new sub rule 4 as per which even if an SSE is manufacturing exempted goods exclusively for a period of two years, if within two years period, if any duty is imposed on the finished product, there is no bar on taking credit on such capital goods. But this important amendment has not been properly explained in the JSTRU letter. In addition to the above, certain other amendments have also been made to the Senvat credit rules. Now, capital goods of value up to 10,000 rupees are treated as inputs. The result is 100 percent credit can be taken in the same financial year and also depreciation can be claimed under the Income Tax Act. In addition to that, equipment appliances used in office of the factory are also covered under the capital goods. Now, we will come to the big, big, big amendment the rule 6 and Sanvat credit rules. When you have to, when you had taken credit on common inputs or let us say dutiable and non-dutiable, this has been a long war going on between the department and the SSCs. So, do you think the changes are simple, easy to understand and easy to enforce? Uh, the rule 6 refund uh, procedure that was existing in the past was so complex, I think uh, 
just to avoid the complexity, many of the SSEs opted for reversing 6%. I think as a company, we also exercise that option because to just to avoid complexity, because the cost of complying will be much, much more than doing that activity itself. With the result, uh, as you said, I think uh, uh, what we reversed is far more higher than what we cre taken credit. I think uh, from that uh, situation today, I think uh, uh, it is far more better. Uh, I think uh, far more looks rational uh, with reference to the kind of procedure and uh, formulas that has been given. But I think uh, for a larger corporations where too many number of transactions will be there, tracking and uh, reporting and computing and giving this information is going to involve exercise. But I think uh, looking at the looking at the revenue involved, I think it's worth the effort. But uh, on the other hand, they could have simplified uh, like the way the captive valuation they take cost account and certificate. Similarly, they could have also taken a certificate of a first qualified accountant, and based on his advice, they could have reversed it. Probably they could have designated a panel of accountants so assess and go to them and get that audited and done. But in any case, I think uh, compared to the past, I think it is a welcome step. But we have to exercise that option and communicate to the department. Yeah. In fact, on that, sir, uh, I think on the option also, they have now made a major change that you, you are not going to be condemned to hell if you don't give the option in the beginning. You can give the option even uh, uh, at the time of the show cause notice or uh, adjudication process. Yes, sir, Mr. Raman. Okay. Let me put it this way, 6.3 has been one of the contorted piece of the provisions. You know, uh, rightly so, uh, probably one of the, that's, that's one of the reasons why one of the, you know, a judge while disposing of a case said like, this bit of legislation is not understood either by the lawyers or by the revenue officers or at times even by the judges themselves. Let's look at what's, what exactly is the basis of the complication. If I'm going to be providing both taxable goods and exempted goods, how do I know what exactly goes only into taxable goods or exempted goods? And therein lies the major problem. My perception, the amendments that have been carried out, is bound to simplify it, but needs to be tested. How exactly easy it is going to be as a concept needs to be tested. And also how this is going to be, you know, while, while I can opt for one of the two options at any point of time, how this is going to be received by the revenue authorities on ground, again needs to be tested. Because end of the day, the whole of the issue doesn't arise if I have clearly demarcated goods or services that inputs or input services that go into exempted goods or taxable goods or exempted services vis-a-vis -vis taxable services. That's not really going to happen. The demarcation is not really easy, I mean, easy uh, option to speak of. And therefore, the simplification is extremely welcome especially in relation to the 6.3 as it stood till now. So that would be my take on that. Okay. You have something, sir, Mr. I think from an industry perspective, uh, if, you, if you have, uh, if your products are the same, which are being, uh, let's say, going for the exempted part as well as this one, it's going to be extremely difficult to track this, uh, uh, track this uh, uh, on an input uh, services basis. Uh, tracking mechanism is going to be difficult. Though is, I think so is a welcome step, at least uh, to an extent, some ease has happened. But uh, as what uh, 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 was committed earlier, that if we if we can come with a uh, provision where a cost accountant statement can be put in and can be taken as a basis, that's going to be helpful. But if that's not the case, I think for industry to track this separately by uh, input mechanism where each and every input is tracked is going to be extremely difficult. Yes, sir. Yeah, ultimately. It should not result in again our choosing either six or seven percent as the case may be. It should be as simple as that. So it should facilitate really the best of the two options. Yes, sir, Mr. Tirumalai, how do you conclude this? Yeah. 
I think that there are, uh, if I may say so, uh, four or five inbuilt mechanisms. Even if the formula is not right, the algebra is not understood, etc. Some safety valve is there in this provision. The first one is it is restricted to the maximum of the total credit available. Yes. I think that is the first safety valve, which was not there, it was the sky in the previous mm -hmm. situation. The second one is that the duty of excise paid even in respect of exempted goods can get reduced as an option which is available now, both uh, with respect to services as well as with respect to goods. If you have paid something, then that can be reduced for the purpose of final reckoning, which was not there before. Then there is an availability in respect of outsourced manufacturing also, units which can also be brought within the purview of this mathematics which is there. And I would consider that the safety net which they have provided is the most important uh, feature. And as I mentioned earlier, this is something which they could have extended or made available for reduction of all the previous show cost notices wherever SSEs were prepared to pay, it would have been a better success than your DRP or the dispute resolution program which you are having. That is all. Fine. Uh, as Mr. Dirmalai has said, the best feature of this amendment has been that your liability is the maximum credit taken. It is not the sky, somewhere near the earth. But I think there is a slight, uh, as the Supreme Court has said in one of the judgments, slight inexactitude in the way the rule is drafted. They say there are options available to the SSEs. One, pay an amount equal to 6% of the value of the exempted goods and 7% of the value of the exempted services, subject to a maximum of the total credit available in the account of the SSE. Now, at the end of the period to which the payment relates. So payment is perhaps for a month. For that month, the maximum payable by him is the amount of credit available with him. So if he can manage it in such a way that his balance is zero, he doesn't need to pay anything. Or if it, uh, if he is not good in managing and if he has a huge credit lying, he may have to reverse the whole credit. Do you think there is something wrong in this which needs correction? I guess at the uh, end of the day, it's more to do with whether it's going to be treated as credit available or as the circular says the credit taken uh, if 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 an SSC is going to end up having a huge amount of let's say inflow of credit from capital goods extraordinary inflow of uh, credit from capital goods in a particular month or at the period where it needs to be readjusted he is going to be put a put a loss or another SSE who is going to be kind of, uh, you know, who is to manage it very comfortably will ensure that he doesn't have much of a credit to do this adjustment at all. Uh, so therefore, I'm, I'm, I'm sure there's going to be a slight addendum or a corrigendum uh, coming up to say that it is not credit available at the end of the period, but credit taken. What do you think, sir? I think that uh, it is necessary to clarify this, though the board circular, uh, the budget circular mentions the, credit taken. Uh, the not once but twice hmm. uh, and also says the intent and purpose. In fact, he uses the words, the purpose of this rule is to deny credit of such part of the total credit taken. Exactly. Again, the word taken is used yes. as is attributable to the exempted goods or exempted services. And under no circumstances, this part can be greater than the whole of the credit. Having said so, so emphatically, I think if we find that there is, and as indeed, there is some ambiguity in the context of the, uh, the wording, uh, 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 re which requires substitution of the word available, uh, then I think it should be uh, represented. I think uh, the board should co come out with uh, an amendment for that. Then there's another small confusion on capital goods used for 
manufacture of exempted goods. Sir, if you have seen that, capital goods exclusively used in exempted goods for two years will not be eligible for credit. What does it mean? I think what I, uh, what I think is in this case, uh, maybe they are bringing out in, uh, for certain industries where, which are only uh, doing uh, products which are meant for exemption. They are doing that particular, particular purpose, but after some time, they also do for domestic. Uh, let's say, I'm talking about a, uh, a couple of export. cases like export services, where I do it for only for export meant for two or three years, and after that, I start doing domestic. Now, export, I think, is covered, sir. So uh, exports are typically not treated as exempted, and therefore, the availability of the credit flows as long as it is exported. exported. It, it comes under a non obstantive clause as long as... Exports or uh, guarantee. But there could be other situations, like uh, you are using it for exempted goods and after some time maybe you will use that same machine to manufacture dutiable yeah. goods. Yeah. So I think that's where the thing is coming, where if you are already used for two years, yes. you don't take the credit. Okay. So that at least that uh, anomaly or thing, the, uh, thing is not there where there is a confusion. But do you think that after two years you can take the credit? No. Essentially, if you see the intention seems to be that unlike inputs which can be immediately taken upon receipts in the factory right capital goods have a dispensation yes the dispensation is that you take 50% yes. and then the remaining 50% you can take subsequent at any years. any time not necessarily in the subsequent years any subsequent years but where the the all along it is in your possession and it is being used for that purpose now they want to say that if you buy capital machinery and use it for goods which have got no excise implication at all, either non-excisable goods or exempted goods, then two years afterwards, like your one-year rule which prohibits you in terms of uh, taking um, uh, input uh, invoices, they have said you lose the right to take on those invoices at any time after the period of two years. It is an artificial curb, like we have got n number of artificial curbs in 2K, 2L, mm. uh, in, the, in, the, in the definition of input and inputs. This yeah. is another artificial curb. See, where it no. is used in exclusively, where it is used in exempted goods manufacture, as rightly pointed out, they are artificially restricting the shelf life to two years. Now, third year, if, if that is going to become taxable, Technically speaking, you are not entitled for the, that part of the CG credit. For that part is what? The first part. Where you are using the, the, the SINVAT credit where it has become taxable. I mean the SINVAT credit of the capital goods which is going to be put to use where let's say that the exempted goods for, a, for the first period of two years has now become taxable. The shelf life of that particular capital goods is no more is considered to have been done with a deeming a deeming shelf life is created so that credit from that capital goods is not available to the entity after two years. It's it's not available in the first two years and it's not available even year after, after that. Even year after, after that. Even after two years. Absolutely. 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 Like you are one year rule for uh, invoices. If you yes. are not taken, gone. Yeah. The gone. Yes. So now this is is it uh, artificial. Now, is it artificial fine, sir? Is it adversarial or beneficial? Of course, adversarial. Of course, <laughs> adversarial. While on capital goods, there has been another important change here that any capital goods valued up to 10,000 rupees is now treated as inputs. What is the implication of this, sir? This, this is certainly beneficial. Yeah, beneficial and I think, if I am not mistaken, Mr. Uh, uh, Suresh will also bear out. On the income tax side also, for purpose of depreciation, small items, individual items of small value uh, have been considered for 100% write-off. So what they have done now is that they have been become brought in parallel uh, provisions from the income tax um, uh, in the, in the, because uh, large manufacturing organizations, BHEL or any of those uh, types have found it extremely difficult to track and keep record exactly. of these 10,000 rupee one piece items. And therefore, I think. And take by, credit twice. Yes. 50% by, yes. by one stroke and then as if, as if removal, 
wherever that was happening <laughs> under 35 uh, uh, exactly. all those 35b all those issues were also there as such removal so in all these cases there is uh, uh, this uh, 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 this benefit which has been given and i think it is a welcome measure because it will avoid a uh, lot of hassles for uh, um, organizations which have had to uh, keep this individual account uh, piece by piece and which income tax had long uh, accepted while on that uh, they have also extended a little further in the sense now office equipment is also allowed on this this aspect on rule 6 and on sanvat credit is there anything that you feel could have been done something more should have been done for a large corporation with multiple units there has been accumulation of sanvat in different units like uh, ltus in major metros there have the option of transferring the credit from one unit to another i think that is not available in place like hyderabad it's existing uh, thing so i think they could have extended that also to uh, hyderabad you want an ltu in hyderabad or uh, you want the ltu in effect what he wants is cross transfer of sanvat credit if one of his units has excess credit and another unit doesn't have enough credit he wants to transfer the credit from one unit to another satrimalai do you think it's feasible or should it be done it's as of now certainly not allowed even for ltu uh, you know if you look at rule 7 uh, it talks about services and the transfer has been allowed via the input service distributor mechanism even to outsource units so if really our problem is that we are not able to uh, dissolve the credits uh, by utilization in the appropriate places then the answer is that at least in so far as services are concerned we could we could have this problem addressed through the input di- distributor Uh, mechanism service distributor mechanism if it is possible i think at, that is a redemption which is available as of now of course the larger question will have to be represented because what was available has been taken away before i wind up let me thank all the guests and my colleague mr vijay kumar for making it a very enlightening and animating debate and the key takeaways for the north block are the cbc needs to take a policy call on whether it should allow or not to resolve the pending litigation relating to rule 6 or some other initiative should be taken to resolve you know the pending litigation particularly with respect to rule 6 whether mr jetly would like to carry eight another bags of legacy cases like the ones in the direct tax side so the industry is also looking for some clarity on credit available versus credit taken a corrigendum would perhaps do the job for the tri thanking you all for watching tri tv